this month from the Revised Common Lectionary that Christian churches and centers around the world focus upon on this given Sunday. This month we have been journeying through the letter of the Hebrews. Now this is an unusual letter, and especially in our unity teaching it is important. This is the only one of the New Testament or the Christian Testament scriptures that speaks of Jesus Christ as the high priest. This is a very special description or characterization of Jesus Christ. And in it, I hope you will hear that the author is indicating an understanding of the Christ as the Son of God, a spiritual being, and makes a distinction of Jesus of Nazareth as the human vessel of that spiritual being. Every high priest is chosen from among mortals and is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as of those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as our first priest, Aaron, was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the very one who said to him, You are my son, Today I have begotten you. As the Spirit also says in another place in the Scriptures, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission in prayer. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he experienced. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, these words of the letter to the Hebrews certainly are mysterious ones, but they attempt to make a distinction for us between this Christ of God, the spiritual being, the divine idea, I am, who is now become, in the evolution of what we call Christianity, the early church, the high priest. The distinction is that the people no longer look to a human priest, but their ultimate teacher, their ultimate way shower, is a spiritual being, the very light of God of life itself. So we make this bridge from a high mysterious scripture now to a lesson and a lesson which begins with this title that I've thought about in a thousand different ways why are we here why are we here why are we here I thought about just 20 minutes of repeating that to you over and over <laughs> But then I thought again. But one could meditate upon those words. A very beautiful lyric on that idea is one that's always stuck in my mind. Written back in the mid-60s, of course I was merely a wee child, barely out of the crib. 
But perhaps you remember that British movie with that intriguing song. What's it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? What's it all about when you sort it out, Alfie? Are we meant to take more than we give? Or are we meant to be kind? And if only fools are kind, Alfie, then I guess it's wise to be cruel. And if long, if life belongs only to the strong, Alfie, what will you lend on an old golden rule? As sure as I believe there's a heaven above, Alfie, I know there's something much more, something even non-believers can believe in. I believe in love, Alfie. Without true love, we just exist, Alfie. Until you find the love you've missed, you're nothing. When you walk, let your heart lead the way, and you will find love any day, Alfie. So we may ask ourselves, what's it all about? Why are we here? What's my purpose? What's the meaning of my life? All these questions are a longing of the heart, of every heart. Some of us will admit the longing. Others will stand in the conviction that we found the true meaning of our life and purpose but I don't know about you, there are night times and dark times when, at least for me, the question still comes to mind. Why am I even here? Well, you may have noticed from our affirmation this morning that our very presence here is evidence of our purpose. You see, when we look to our fundamental teachings, even today, but tracing their roots, as I often do, back to Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, a whole century of what's it all about unity? What's it all about? That we each, as a child or expression of God, that's an easy, comforting, heartfelt cliché. Oh, Karen, you're a child of God. But behind it is a profound meaning. From our scripture today, or from the prayer, excuse me, you heard reference to the words of St. Paul who said, we are all joint heirs. That's probably something that we could ask Kathy about to explain to us what a joint heir is in the way of a will or a trust. It means a shared heir to our spiritual truth, to our spiritual nature. So, we can stand assured, even in times of despair or lack of hope or simply questioning what's it all about, we can stand in the truth. I'm here. My very presence on this planet is a testimony that there is a purpose and there is a value, and there is something for me to do. The Fillmore's based their teaching upon science in the sense that Charles started calling unity in its early years Christian science. Oops, Mary Baker Eddy already got that trademark name in Boston, so he let it go. Later he would work with divine science, spiritual science, and finally, the Fillmore's were unique in this New Thought movement in that they settled upon a term, practical Christianity. No one else was using that. What they meant by it was practicing the truths of Christianity based in their understanding in the gospel or the words or teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and further the realities of what they called the great demonstration that was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
but they used the word science because it meant organized knowledge. Thought following thought. That we begin with a premise. And so when we ask ourselves the sort of heartfelt question of what is my purpose? Why am I here? The Fillmores would say, well, scientifically, we look to the principles of, of our faith. That we are children or expressions of the divine. Therefore, we have a creative purpose in this world. Now, our creative purpose sometimes can take odd and unusual forms. Mine is to have joined the Lake Studio for the Arts next door, and I'm learning and on my second project in knitting. I believe I have mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Finding that creativity in a new way for me through this handwork, any kind of creative work we take on in life, whether it's knitting, mowing the lawn, building a structure, or whatever, there is always a lesson there that teaches us spiritually, teaches us about life itself. Well, I was told of a maximum, a maxim or truth statement in the world of knitting. To always have three projects at hand, three projects going. One, a no-brainer. Two, a take-along. And three, a challenge. We always like those, the challenge. So let me use that today as the model for what our purpose is, what can give meaning and direction to our life. A no-brainer, a common phrase now, and not one that my mother would have used, but she always taught me and maintained this to her 96th year, that although she had gone through the depression and difficult times, when she and my father married in 1943, as an intern in St. Louis, he made the grand salary of $25 a month. Without her getting out there and working, they probably wouldn't have even had food, much less an apartment to live in. But she always said, you think so much, or she'd tell her unity friends, you think about so many details. She said, I have just always trusted that God will give me step by step whatever I need to meet the circumstances of my life. To her that was a no-brainer. It was a given. That was her trust in life itself. So like that knitting maxim goes, you should always have a no-brainer should just relax and trust that life will carry you. As a friend of mine back in Syracuse used to say, she was a well-known uh, organic chef and teacher of healthy life habits or whatever. And she loved to remind people, and she'd often remind me, nature, life has invested so much in you, Karen to just stop and think about it. The investment that life has made in your very existence. A no-brainer. Trust life. Secondly, we have a care, um, excuse me, take along. Not take out. Take out, that's another matter. This is a take along. That we should always have a project in our knitting or whatever that's ready to go with us into the world. We always have it at our side, ready to work with it. Well, as spiritual students, we can do that by taking a basic spiritual principle, taking a little along with us to work, to play, to vacation, everywhere we go, and see it. Search for its application 
in the world. We can take a basic premise, like a seed or idea is always the start. There is always that small beginning before the fruition or the completed project. So we can go out in our lives, at work, at school, wherever it may be, and see if we can discern the seed, the possibilities just at their beginning that given our attention and our support can grow into a mighty oak. So we take these spiritual principles, we take them along and apply them. That Fillmorean practical Christianity, it means putting the ideas the values, the spiritual laws of Christianity into practice in daily life through our daily words, if you will, and our actions. That third maximum of the great master knitter says that there should be a challenge. Others have called it a growing point, a cutting edge that we should be willing to strive or long for something that leads us in to the greater person that we can be. To use this idea of the challenge, you can again take a spiritual principle, for example, love, forgiveness, respect, always has a transforming power. And then, challenge yourself to find that power at work. There's a children's book, quite famous. I've looked at it. <clears throat> I was a little bit old for it at the time. But it's called, Where's Waldo? And we look into very complicated pictures, trying to find this little fellow Waldo. Well, I suggest as spiritual teachers or students, we can remember that and we can seek in our own life, where is God, if you will? Where is spirit birthing something new? And that's a stretch, folks. We have to make an effort to do that. We go out here into the world and we may have like my father liked to say in his last years, oh, you know, some days are diamonds and some days are stones. We have to look harder to find the beauty and the possibility in our given situation, in our community. So let's just re review for a moment three things that we can practice. You know, Spiritual teaching, whether it's unity or any teaching throughout the centuries, we often can think that it has to involve mystical words, complex, difficult ideas, things that we are not capable of, perhaps. That's just a cop-out, an excuse. Your very presence in this life, on this earth, means you have an opportunity to serve life, to enhance life. Or as we commonly hear in our world today, to make life or the world a better place for your presence and your being. So wherever we go, we can take these three basic ideas. They're not the only ones. They are just an example. That we can take something simple, a no-brainer, and trust life. Trust that life will support us as the water supports us when we swim. Trust life. Relax. It's like the knitter doing a certain project. A certain friend of mine likes to always fall back on the ease of creating dishcloths. And we have a lot 
of humorous exchanges about that. But that's what it is. It's to do something that's not a strain, not difficult. Breathing is one example. But it's something that we can do in a state of calm. But the trick is consistency. As Myrtle Fillmore said, that's what it's all about. Consistency. Our breath teaches us that. If we just do it occasionally, what happens? Well, a lot of things can happen. It's our body teaching us the power of consistency. So that's our no-brainer. Something that we can just do easily with conviction and confidence. And then that second step, the take-along. To take a spiritual principle, maybe it's something that you just read that day in Daily Word, and take it in to your life. Take it along with you everywhere you go. Find it in action. Apply it yourself in all that you do. Working these spiritual principles, as you all know because you're advanced students, is not about Sunday morning here at Unity. This is where we get fired up. This is where we encourage one another. But the real work is out there, beyond these walls, where we go into an environment that doesn't use unity speak. Sometimes it speaks in a way of pessimism or in a very negative manner. We have to take our ideas and our practices into the world, a take-along. And finally, if we want to grow, if we want to evolve at any age, and that was the great gift my mother gave me. People would say, Wilda, I, you're still wanting to learn. You're in your 90s. They were just amazed. She once expressed it by saying, I will sell, not really sell, but she would promote hope. And I would watch far younger people in our Unity family back in New York, far younger people, greatly inspired by a woman of her age at that stage in life that was still actively seeking, excited about life. And many of them would say, that gave me such hope because I'm 40 years younger than she is and I've kind of and she's like, still excited. And maybe if I make it to 90, I can still be excited. Mother was a witness to joy and to excitement. So if we want to maintain that, we must continually challenge ourselves. You may not want to say, where's Waldo or where's God? But that's the idea. To challenge yourself especially in times that you don't get it, you don't see it, or you don't feel it, to challenge yourself to still find it. When you don't see it, you don't believe it, you don't feel it, to challenge yourself to still find it. There is always something good because God is always and everywhere present. We can always find something worthwhile in ourselves, in one another, in all our communities, in our world. It's up to us to meet that challenge. So let us take a moment and Turn within, in a simple meditation, just recalling these steps, I invite you to close your eyes, make your body comfortable in the chair,
and with your mind's eye, your creative imagination. Imagine yourself just doing an easy, rhythmical activity. It might be knitting, it might be fishing, a hobby, maybe even one of those daily chores. Perhaps something as simple as laundry. But it's something you can do effortlessly. It does not require struggle and strain. You simply allow yourself to rest in the easy rhythm or movement of the activity. And pause for a moment in the silence. And allow this restful, going with the flow of life, to well up in you as a sense of well-being. The conviction that, indeed, you trust the flow of life. You have a conviction that is, we speak in the Lord's Prayer that the daily bread, all that is necessary, will be given to us day by day. to the second stage of our experience, our take-along. You may choose to call to mind someone from school or work, a neighbor, maybe even a family member. and affirm that the activity of God is working uniquely in that individual. You may not understand their choices or even their behaviors, but you can affirm that their very presence in this world indicates that they are A life born by God with a value and purpose. They are seeking their gift to give the world. We rest for a moment in the silence with this inner image we have created. We take a third step in mind, the step of the challenge. And the very first decision we must make is, am I willing to be transformed? Am I willing to go through the process of change? 
in order to grow. In order to have a new experience in this world, in order to bring a new gift to my community, to my world. So for a moment in the silence, I invite you to ask any fixed thought, any hard feeling, anything that seems unchangeable within you, to come to your mind's eye. And as you are willing, to pose this question or this statement. I am willing to be transformed. I am willing to change. I am willing to grow, to be made new. And rest in the silence as the guiding spirit of truth helps you walk this path. Gently now we allow our attention to return to this outer sanctuary, those seated around us. And as we make this transition, we remember we have held the question, we have held the longing within the silence of our heart, seeking direction for how we may apply this truth in life how we may make our Christianity, our spirituality, practical. To put it to work, to see it demonstrate good, demonstrate God's presence in this world. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Amen.